mentioned a couple weeks ago that Catholics have much better jokes than Protestants. And uh, some of you have been giving me good jokes on this. Uh, I heard an interesting retelling of uh, the story of the woman caught in adultery where uh, she is dragged before Jesus. By the way, it's always interesting whenever it's the woman caught in adultery because I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but um, you can't commit adultery by yourself. <laughs> so the question is, where was the other person? Anyway, so she's dragged in front of Jesus, and uh, he says, you know, famously, he says, let the one who is without sin cast the first stone. And from over his shoulder comes this giant rock and hits the woman right in the head, opening up a wound, and blood is flowing down her face, and everyone is shocked. And Jesus turns around and says, Mom! <laughs> Now that's a very Catholic joke. That is not a Protestant joke. And some of you don't like that joke very much. And I don't blame you. In the Gospel of John last week, we uh, talked about the power of words as we introduced this new series on words make worlds. I want to continue in John chapter 1, starting in verse 14. And the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory the glory of the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. From his fullness we have received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. This idea that the Word became flesh is one of the most incredible and inspiring ideas in all of Scripture. It is also so deeply troubling to anybody who would have actually known in uh, Greek philosophy this idea of the Logos, the, the eternal Word. The, the, the thing that made it the eternal Word is that it didn't take on flesh. So this is the paradox of the early church is the gospel. This is the paradox of what they were trying to convey in the gospels. When the word takes on flesh and dwells among us, existence itself changes. Life itself is transformed. This is an incredible thing that you can spend years meditating on and never come to the bottom of. It's actually so incredible to think about this, what it means right for Emmanuel this is what makes Christmas so amazing is God with us Emmanuel in this really unique and particular way Jesus is like a sign right a road sign that points to a greater reality no one's ever seen God but Jesus shows us what God is like and this is something unique that Christianity brings to the world is that we believe, we don't require anyone else to believe it, but we believe that this person, Jesus, there, there was something truly unique about his ministry that showed humanity God in a new way or a more profound way or in, in a new light. And so we celebrate this. And Christmas, it's why we turn on all the lights and we sing big songs and we celebrate, right? And we lift candles and we do all of that a liturgical stuff every year is to celebrate how amazing this is. And yet, <clears throat> sometimes we need to, in the hangover after the holidays, we need to sober up a little bit and say, hey, that was fun. Uh, just out of curiosity, what was all that about? And so we have the opportunity here to talk about being human because in christmas a lot of the spotlight goes on the christ child right that god being among us and that's fantastic but the early churches really wanted us to know that jesus was fully divine and also fully human we happen to live in a time in history where being human isn't what it used to be and so whether you talk about transhuman or human 2.0 Something is changing in the way not only that we relate to each other, but that we relate even to ourselves. 
Being human has never been as difficult or as complex, one might say, as it is today. And so it's a good chance for us as a community to talk about what does it mean for Jesus to be fully human. I stumble on this problem when I meet people from uh, other traditions or other backgrounds, and I will ask them a really simple question. How did Jesus heal? So in the gospel stories, Jesus will sometimes heal people, physically bring them relief or restoration. How did he do it? And almost without exception, the person will answer me, he was God. And that breaks my heart. It breaks my heart because we have not understood that being fully human, the depth of humanity opens up different possibilities. So what I'll do is I'll follow up with another question and I'll say, do you think Jesus was good at math? People say, yeah, I guess so, which is not the right answer. And I'll say, why? And they'll say, he was God. And God's perfect, so God knows everything. So I'm, I'm assuming he was good at everything. And I just think, well, that's not being very human, is it? If you're perfect and good at everything, that's not a full human experience. Anybody here have any flaws? <laughs> no? All right. Some of you, okay. I have a lot. They're often on display. That's part of being human. Part of the thing about being human is you're not great at everything. This morning we were talking about the Enneagram, the personality profiles. And, you know, there are these nine primary, and it becomes 27 ways, uh, styles of moving in the world. And you see the beauty of people's personalities in different families, in different communities, in different situations, and friendship groups. And we need each other because no one has it all. Right? That's why we celebrate that. So when somebody, I say, if the, do you think Jesus was good at math? And they say, yes. So my third question is, do you think Jesus ever got diarrhea? <laughs> and this is a deeply theological question. Because people will say, no, gross. And I'll say, really? Because, you know, humans have tummy troubles. I mean, that's part about being human, right? So do you don't think Jesus' teeth ached before modern dentistry? You don't think his teeth hurt? No, why? He was God. And I start to get troubled when the God part or the divine part of our Jesus story gets outsized and out of balance because all of a sudden we have to start questioning then in what way was he human? It's almost like Jesus was in disguise or camouflage that he had like a flesh suit on but really, it's more of a Clark Kent persona, where at any point, if he stepped into a magical phone booth, he could have just peeled off this mud suit, and the divine underneath would have been revealed. And we've made Jesus into an unhuman, or a less than human, or a non-human, or a superhuman. Anything other than really human. So you have to stop and say, what have we done where this amazing thing that the, the word became flesh and dwelt among us is being minimized in order so that we can exalt some sort of ideal divinity. We have minimized the very experience of being human. My fourth and final question is always, when Jesus met somebody new, do you think he knew everything about them, including their future? People say, yeah, I suppose so. I say, why? He was God. God knows everything. I say, that has to be the worst, most deceptive way of being human ever. That if you meet somebody and instantly know everything about them, including their future. So Jesus never had an actual human encounter. He never actually engaged somebody human to human. Who have we made Jesus into? In my mind, it's monstrous. It's deceptive at best. Co totally corrupt at worst. I think it's good for us in the hangover after Christmas to say exactly what are we celebrating. And I want to propose to you today 
that the reason that the celebration is so good is because it's an invitation for you and I to be fully human. I love Jesus. Some of you are thinking, good. I mean, you're a minister. We would hope so. But, no, I mean, I really love Jesus. I love so many things about Jesus. And one of them that fascinates me to no end is what makes Jesus truly unique that we would say, this is a person worthy of worship and modeling our whole life after. What was so darn unique? And so I read a lot about this stuff. And one of the people that I have found, his name is John Cobb, has a really interesting way of talking about this. And he says, Jesus is interesting on two levels. One that is very much for us to model ourselves after, and the other is quite unique. But what makes Jesus so unique is that he was aware of God's presence in his life to such a degree that it began to comprise his very character. And he ended up saying some really profound things like, I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Now, you and I will never say something like that, one would hope. <clears throat> but in the example of Jesus, we see that he was open to the divine purpose in his life, open to God's presence in his life, we might say, in a way that started to transform and inform and form his very character. This is actually an invitation for you and I as disciples to open ourselves in a brand new way, to be aware of the divine presence in the world, to be open to our calling. Now where Jesus gets really unique is even if you, in your station of life, in your vocation, in your ministry, are as open to God's purpose in your life as Jesus was open to the, God's purpose in Jesus' life, the difference is you're not called to be the Messiah, Savior of the world. That's a, that's a big difference. Some of you think, well, I, some days I think I could save the whole world. <clears throat> and we need to talk about that. I today want to talk about what it means to be human. So I'm going to give you a question. I want you to marinate on it for a second. What's your favorite part about being human? What's your favorite part about being human? I want to put up a slide, and I just want to say, if we can put up the slide of the list of things, just some things that I thought of about the intricate web of ingredients overlapping and mutually informing that make for the human experience. Obviously, your age matters, your gender, your race, class, what region you were born into, your unique personality, the family that you were born into, your sexuality, religion, and the time, your era, that you exist. So these are just 10 ingredients of probably about 80 or 90 I could have listed in this magnificent web of meaning. Christmas is an opportunity for you and I to celebrate that God is not embarrassed or disgusted or distant from our human experience, but that God is within the human experience and that you and I, by embracing the divine presence and purpose in our life, become more full versions of the humanity that we have that we become more fully human as we open ourselves to the divine purpose in our life. That's an amazing opportunity. That Jesus wasn't some superhuman or, or unhuman, but by being fully human opens up the possibility for you and I to be ourselves more fully human. 
So I want to talk about that in a minute. 